Michelle Gafford melodramatic to start off the night. I don't know why we did that, but I just wanted to use it because it came with the sermon series. So I just thought that was fun. All right. We're going to dive right in because we get a jam-packed 25 minutes and I want to make sure we are back at the ministry center in time for worship. So let me ask you a question. Just show of hands. Who knows how to juggle? Like tennis balls, hacky sacks. So a couple of you guys, maybe flaming swords or like, you know, flaming uh, bowling pins, whatever. You guys know how to juggle. Okay. I can't juggle one tennis ball. I can't. I, I couldn't do it. But let me rephrase the question. Do you guys know how to juggle the things that are going on in life? Okay, so maybe you have a job, maybe you're working a job, right? Schoolwork, I've got schoolwork too. I work a job or two. Household chores, okay? So we got to juggle those things, right? And then we have to mix in relationships, boyfriends, girlfriends, friends, how we're going to prioritize who we spend time with, throw some drama in there. And you might feel a little bit of anxiety or fear or stress when we think about juggling all of those things, right? It's a lot to juggle. And you guys are at an age where you're either getting ready to go off to college or you're starting to think about college or maybe you're starting to question, like, what's your purpose in life? Like, who am I created to be and what is my role on this planet? And then you come here on a Wednesday night and I challenge you week in and week out to follow Jesus. And so that could lead to more questions and more juggling. So now you've got to juggle your faith. Mixed in with all that other stuff. So you might be sitting here and asking yourself something like, do I really believe all this Christianity stuff or is it just my family's religion? Are you just getting dropped off on a Wednesday night to be here because you have to be here? Or do you actually believe what you're being taught? So you might have that question. Or you might ask yourself, is it cool to just be a sideline Christian and believe that God is real but not live by what this tells me I should be doing? Is that okay? That might be a question you have. Or maybe sometimes, this was me a long time ago, I have so many questions, I don't know what to do with all my questions, so my question is, what do I do with all my questions, God? Right? Maybe that's you if you're sitting here. And you guys, those are all really good questions. And that's why I'm really glad you guys are sitting here tonight, because tonight we're going to look at doubt. We're going to look at doubt, and I think it's a really good topic to look at, especially as we head into Easter. And I think it would be easy to believe all the things of the Easter story Jesus' death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven. If we had hung out with Jesus, right? If he was our homeboy and we got to do life with him and have conversations with him and break bread with him and, and watch him witness miracles. And maybe even if we witnessed his death on the cross. Now, it's not something I would have wanted to see. But if I had seen it happen, it would make it that much easier to believe. And then if I had experienced the empty tomb, I wouldn't have so many questions. Right? Do you think it'd be easier? Because seeing is believing. If we had lived with Jesus during that time and experienced those things, we might not have doubt, right? I argue that that's not necessarily true, and we're going to look at a couple stories in Scripture that prove that point. <clears throat> but we need to have faith. Because I don't think Jesus is going to meet me on my way to my car tonight and say, hey, Wendy, what questions do you have that I can answer for you? Like, he's not going to do that. So, I, well, he might, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think he's going to show up at McDonald's tonight. But Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Faith is the evidence of things we cannot see. But that's easier said than done, right? It's easier said than done. But here's the deal. I have a picture of a mustard seed. Maybe we can put that slide up. This is a mustard seed. Can you guys see that? This is how much faith we need to have. Just this little guy right here, that mustard seed. And here's the really cool thing. This is enough faith for everybody in the building tonight. This little teeny tiny jar of mustard seeds. There's enough faith to go around for everybody. All we need is just a mustard seed size of faith, and God will do the rest. He will do the rest. He tells us this in Matthew 17, 20. It says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. You can have both faith and doubts. And if you're anything like me, you do have both faith and doubts. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. So as we look at the account of Jesus in Scripture, that is what we know is the Easter story, it seems like a plot to a crazy movie as we look through the events that happened leading up to his death and resurrection. But what scripture tells us is that he died on the cross for our sins, 
We know that, right? His blood shed for us so that we can live in freedom, just covered by his love. And then on the third day, he came back to life, and then he rose to heaven and is seated now at the right hand of the Father. So th that's the Easter story. But as you hear the basics of the Easter story, I implore you to ask yourself, what do I really believe? What do I really believe about the Easter story? Because it's a lot to absorb. But even the tiniest bit of faith, the size of the mustard seed, can help you have faith with that story. And you can ask God to help you in your unbelief. So when we look at Easter, there's some questions we can have, questions we can have about Jesus' death and resurrection. And probably the biggest question that many people have is, well, how did he get undead? Right? How did he resurrect himself from the dead? How did he come back to life? It's kind of a mind-blowing question if you think about it. And then if you don't have that question, or maybe you do, maybe you might ask yourself, how do I know it really happened? How do I know it really happened? Or maybe you're asking yourself, what if it actually didn't happen? Or maybe you're asking yourself, okay, maybe it did happen, but so what? How does that relate to me now this many, 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 many years later? That was so long ago. Why does it matter to me? So doubt can look different to every single one of us. And I think over the course of my many years, I've asked myself these questions, many of these questions, as I'm sure maybe you have over the past years, or maybe you sit here tonight and you have those questions. And if you do, that's okay. That is okay. I'm just glad you're here. I think it's easy to think that if we had seen it ourselves, we wouldn't have doubt, but that's not the case. That's not the case. Even Jesus' followers who saw him every single day had doubts and questions, especially around the time of his death. And so our big idea tonight is this. The love of Jesus is bigger than our doubts. The love of Jesus is bigger than our doubts. Like that tiny mustard seed, there's more than enough faith to go around, and that is all we need. So I'm going to share three examples in Scripture where his his followers showed moments of doubt during the events of his death and resurrection. So we'll set the stage. So Jesus, he's betrayed by Judas. Now, we don't really know why. Judas was one of his followers, one of his disciples, and he turns his back on Jesus. I would imagine at some point he must have had some doubts about who Jesus was or he would not have betrayed him. So we don't know why, but we know he was arrested. So he's arrested, why? Because he says he's the son of God. But here's the thing. He is the son of God. So there was no crime committed, but that was the crime that he was being charged with. It's kind of hard to get your head around, but that, that's kind of what was going on in that scene. So he's taken into custody and he's being escorted into the, the um, courtyard, right, of the whole the high priest. And this is what the scene might have looked like. We have a picture. So they're walking along with these torches and they have weapons. And it's just this ominous scene, right, as they come and arrest Jesus and they're escorting him into the courtyard. Blazing torches, it says. Blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons. Now, Peter, who was one of his disciples, he had been with him throughout much of his ministry. He was with him when he was arrested. And he's with this escort, right? And they're going to the courtyard. And as they get to the gates, the gatekeeper doesn't know who Peter is. And she's like, hold on a minute. You can't come in. You can't come in. So Peter's told he has to stay outside the gate of the courtyard. And this is the interaction he has with the woman at the gate. So I'm going to pick up. John 18, I'm just going to read a couple verses. John 18, 15 through 17, and this is what it says. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she, she let Peter in. And the woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said. I am not. So in that moment, for whatever reason, Peter was questioning what was going on, and he denied Jesus. Even though he had just been with him as he was arrested, he denied him. He denied him. I'm sure in that, in that moment as he was arrested and he's seeing all these things happen to Jesus, he's probably wondering, like, did I misunderstand Jesus' teaching? Is Jesus who he says he is? How can God let this happen? Imagine you spend years of your life with this man. He's discipling you. He's teaching you. You stay in his presence. You eat with him. You get to wit him, see him perform miracles. And that's what Peter and the other disciples had experienced, which was why it was so confusing that he was arrested. How could this happen? Everyone expected Jesus to be their Messiah, their Savior, and their King. 
but suddenly their world was ripped out from underneath them as this was happening. And I think like Peter, sometimes it's easy for us to think we've been wrong about Jesus, like maybe he felt he was in that moment with his doubt. So soon after that experience, Jesus is, goes on trial, he's convicted, he's beaten, he's tortured, and he's crucified. His death was very public, it was humiliating, it was painful, and if there was ever a time for his disciples to doubt him, it was then. How could this happen? If he was the Messiah, why allow himself to die on the cross? That's probably one of the biggest questions people ask. He could have prevented it, but he didn't. He didn't because he loves us that much. He loves us that much. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit in the story now. Jesus has been crucified. He's, he's died, and he's now been placed in the tomb. So picture this big stone cave, okay? So his body is placed in the tomb, and they roll this ginormous stone in front of the opening. So there's no way in and no way out. Many of you probably already have a picture of this in your mind because you've heard this story many times. But we meet Mary Magdalene in the story, and she was one of Jesus' followers also. So she's the one that finds the empty tomb. She goes in and finds the empty tomb. And we're going to pick up, I'm just going to read a couple of verses in John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And this is what it says. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. We don't know where they have put him, she says. So in that moment, she's thinking that either somebody's playing a joke on her or they've come and they've taken his body, they've stolen him or they've moved his body. She didn't instantly think to herself, oh, snap, he raised himself from the dead. He's not here. That's not logical. Like, why would we even think that? Because that's just not the way we're wired, right? And I think some of the disciples sometimes... just like them, we struggle to believe the good news of Jesus, even when we see the evidence right in front of us. Even when we see the evidence. So we're going to jump ahead a few verses now. So Mary's come into the empty tomb. She's had an, an encounter with an angel. And then she's sitting outside the tomb, and she's getting ready to leave. And she's sitting there weeping. And this is what it says in John 20, verses 14 to 16. If I, my eyeballs can find it. Okay. It says, she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. And she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which is Hebrew for teacher. So in that moment, it was like the wool was taken away from her eyes, and she suddenly recognized him, whether it was his voice or what. And I would imagine it was one of those moments where she's rubbing her eyes and she's like, is this really happening? Like, am I really comprehending that Jesus is standing here in front of me? It probably was really hard for her to believe that as she's looking at it. But she tells her, or Jesus tells her to go and tell the rest of the disciples the good news, that he's risen from the dead and that he is going to ascend into heaven. So as the news spreads of his resurrection, many believed just on that mustard seed size bit of faith. Many believe the good news, but then there are many who don't. There are many who don't believe it. Some still doubted that he could possibly be alive. So we're going to take a look at one more account of how another of Jesus' followers doubted, and we're going to go right to John further ahead in chapter 20, and it's verses 24 through 29, and you can follow along on the screen. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hands into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now, okay, Thomas was the kind of guy that needed proof and evidence, right? You know people like that in your life? 
I do. I know people that are like, show me the facts, show me the figures, show me the data, and I'll believe. That's how Thomas was. And so Jesus was faithful, and he revealed himself to Thomas to help him overcome his disbelief. Peter, Thomas, and Mary all had moments of doubt. They all had moments of doubt, and they were the ones that did life with Jesus. Even when we look at those first moments in the empty tomb, John 29 says this, for until, they, for until then they still hadn't understood the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. So they had been taught this, and the scripture from the Old Testament showed them this. It was a prophecy that this was going to happen, and yet they still didn't comprehend what was actually happening. They doubted. You ever feel sometimes like you don't understand it either? They had spent time with Jesus, but even they were overwhelmed by doubts, questions, and fears. All that to say that your doubt is normal. Your questions are normal. It's okay to have questions like they were probably asking at that time, like, God, what am I supposed to do? What do I do now, God? Maybe there's stuff going on in your life right now, and you're like, what am I supposed to do with this, God? I don't know. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, what's true about this story? How can this possibly be true? Or maybe you're asking, if I can't see you anymore, God, are you actually with me? Are you with me? Because I can't see you. I can't see you. But spoiler alert, while they were still doubting, questioning, and full of fear, Jesus showed up each and every time. And even though we don't physically see him, he shows up time and time again. No matter how big their doubts seemed, Jesus' love for them was bigger, and he met them each in the midst of their doubts. No doubt or fear would keep Jesus from loving them, and it won't stop him from loving you either, even in the midst of your doubts. And I think that's good news. I think that's really good news, and I think Jesus demonstrates that over and over and over again. And when we see, when we see that when Jesus died, even his closest friends and followers had questions, it makes me feel okay with my doubts, right? I mean, sometimes we look at that story and we don't even like take notice of the fact that they had these doubts. That we read through the story, we've heard it so many times. I think sometimes we miss that. We miss that they had these doubts, but it's normal. Jesus wasn't offended. He wasn't angry. He wasn't insulted by their doubts, but instead he was patient and loving and just gently reminded them of the good news. The good news that there is nothing that could separate them from his love. So we're going to go back to one of my favorite passages, and it's one we've read many times over the last several weeks, and I think it bears repeating tonight because it's just a point I want to drill home. And it's Romans 8, 38 and 39. Some of you have heard this. This is what it says. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good news. When we're confused, when we're questioning, when we're doubting, when we need proof of who Jesus is and what he did, I'm reminded that God is with us and that he loves us. And this is all we need. This is all we need. That's it. If Jesus can't be defeated by death, he sure as heck is not going to be defeated by our doubts. He's not. And that brings us back around to our big idea, which is that Jesus' love is bigger than your doubts. His love is so much bigger than your doubts. I think for some reason, when we have these doubts about Jesus, we tend to believe that we're not good enough or that our faith isn't real. But like I said, we can have faith and doubt at the same time. Doubt is not a bad thing. It was part of the story then, and it's part of the story now. It's part of our story. And maybe that seems counterintuitive, but doubt can lead us into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Doubt can cause us to search for answers to the questions that draw us closer to Jesus. I think that's why we have doubt. Because if we don't have doubt, then we don't need to search for answers. Our doubt can look different like it did for Peter, Mary, and Thomas. Maybe we need courage and clarity like Peter did. He needed to really see what was going on. He didn't understand, and he needed some clarity. Or maybe like Mary Magdalene, we needed comfort and hope. Maybe in your time of doubt, you need comfort and hope. Or maybe like Thomas, you need evidence and reassurance. 
I know there's times in my life when I want proof of something. But the good news is that Jesus can give us all of those things. He can give us clarity, comfort, hope, reassurance. So as we close our time here together tonight, and I realize we've covered a ton of ground, hopefully I've given you a little bit of a different perspective on the Easter story. And I know that when we try to reconcile Easter bunnies and chocolate and Easter egg hunts with celebrating the profound importance of the Easter season, it can be confusing. It can be confusing, especially when you have questions and when you have doubts. But don't forget, you are not alone. It was confusing for Jesus' first followers too. It's okay if you don't have an answer to every question or, re or a resolution for every fear and doubt. And I'm certain that I did not answer tonight every single question that you have. That was not my intent. I want you to leave here tonight knowing it's okay to have questions, knowing it's okay to have doubts. That's legit. It's a real thing. But here's what I hope you do take away from tonight. Jesus is not surprised or afraid of your questions. He's not surprised by your questions. He's always going to help you, and he's always going to intervene on your behalf, even when you don't realize it, because that's who he is. Remember, as you leave here tonight, that nothing will ever change his love for you. Never. There's nothing you can do that will separate you from God's love. And that brings me back around to our big idea once again, that is, um, the love of Jesus is bigger than your doubts today. It's bigger than your doubts tomorrow. And it will be bigger than your doubts forever. Forever. So in the midst of our doubts and fears, Jesus can give us hope. Let's pray. God, I just, I just thank you for who you are and how big you are. And I just thank you that, that you sent Jesus because you love us so much. That you sent him to die on the cross, a painful and brutal death, Lord, to cover our sins, to, to just wash away every wrongdoing that we've ever done, Lord, because you love us that much. And sometimes I think as we, as we look at the account in Scripture and just the idea itself that he raised from the dead, it can be hard to understand that. And we can have doubts. And God, I just feel so encouraged tonight that all we need is that teeny tiny little mustard seed of faith and that you can meet us in the midst of our unbelief and help us search for the answers and come alongside us the way you always do. You can give us clarity. You can give us hope. You can give us reassurance. Thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. We love you so much, Lord, and I just lift this night up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.